The verdict of the second jury that Alger Hiss was guilty was an important event in American political and cultural history. No other single event created as much fear of communist treason by Americans. Hiss's conviction was a disaster for American liberalism, the Democratic Party, and the country's establishment. A man who symbolized the best and the brightest of the governing class of the last 16 years was convicted of what amounted to treason. Now, many Democrats and liberals and top people of all political persuasions had taken his side and given him free advice, given him money, spoken up for him at cocktail parties, and these people stood almost equally condemned, not as traitors themselves, but as people who couldn't recognize one in their midst. And these are the people who claim to be so smart and have better brains than most people. But on a matter of treason, they turned out to be blinded either by tribal loyalty or the feeling that Alger went to Harvard and laws are for little people. And these are the kind of people we used to trust with foreign policy. Turns out they're, completely, they're particularly incompetent at that. Um, one thing that a lot of people who lived through this period comment about is that something uh, happened later, uh, soon, that made Hiss's credibility or doubts about his guilt fall almost to zero. In Britain, shortly after the guilty verdict of Hiss in this country, one of the scientists who that country gave to our atom bomb project, a German named Klaus Fuchs, confessed that he had passed atomic secrets to the Russians. And Fuchs was another one of these, the last person you'd ever expect to be a Soviet spy people. Hiss's conviction was red meat for Republicans. Uh, there had been people screaming for years, there are commies hiding in the woodwork, but Hiss's conviction gave them a credibility they hadn't had before. And not long after Hiss's conviction, Joe McCarthy gave his first speech about, I have a list of so many card-carrying communists who were in the State Department. And that speech is usually taken as the start of the McCarthy era. And the Hiss case was sort of the curtain raiser, the overture to that. Now, the McCarthy era, is its merits and demerits are far beyond the scope of these videos. I think it was not so much a conservative versus liberal thing as it was a middle class and lower class uprising or revulsion with the upper crust types like Hiss, who sold the country down the river, or in too many cases had been too stupid to see that that's what Hiss was doing. Um, if anyone embodied the upper crust more than Hiss, it was his old colleague in the State Department, uh, Dean Acheson. Um, Atchison had become Secretary of State under President Truman, and he now walks on stage for the second time in this case, again playing the role of Greek chorus, saying what's on the minds of some people. On the day Hiss was sentenced, he was at a press conference and was asked if he had any comment on Hiss's conviction. And his answer showed, I think, the best and the worst of the old WASP establishment, very high standards of personal integrity, but also its appearance of snottiness and its disregard of public opinion or some would say common sense, which are important when you're holding public office. Atchison was at a press conference. One of the journalists asked him, do you have any thoughts about Hiss's conviction? And here's what he said. Mr. Hiss Mr. Hiss's case is before the courts, and I think that it would be highly improper for me to discuss the legal aspects of the case or the evidence or anything to do with the case. I take it that your purpose was to bring something other than that out of me. I should like to make it clear to you that whatever the outcome of any appeal, I do not intend to turn my back on Alger Hiss. I think every person who has known Alger Hiss or has served with him at any time has upon his conscience the very serious task of deciding what his attitude is. For me, there's very little doubt about those standards and those principles. They were stated for us a very long time ago on the Mount of Olives, and if you are interested in seeing them, you will find them in the 25th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning with verse 34. The pertinent verse is, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. Well, Republicans were howling with outrage and you know, telling President Truman he should turn his back on Atchison and how many more traitors won't you turn your back on. And Atchison saw President Truman later that day and offered his resignation. And in what I find a very moving scene, um, Truman said, uh, no, Dean, you did the right thing. You're still my man. 
you stuck by your friends when they're in trouble. And uh, he reminded Atchison that when he, Truman, had been a bankrupt haberdasher in Kansas City around 1919, he got a job from the corrupt Democratic Party boss of Kansas City, Jim Prendergast. And he said, in 1945, Jim Prendergast died, friendless and broke, just after getting out of prison. And I went to his funeral. And oh, did the media have fun with that. I took a lot of criticism. But I had to stand by a friendless old man who's just out of the penitentiary. And he said to Atchison, in the long run, after all the hullabaloo is over, people re will remember that you're a man who's stuck by his friends, and that's what counts. Now later, Atchison chided himself for using what he called an awful phrase. And he was asked, uh, he was before a Senate committee uh, sometime later, and they were asked, would you care to explain what you meant when you said you wouldn't turn your back on Alger Hiss? He said, glad to. He said, first, my refusal to discuss the merits of the case did not seem to me debatable. Second, why did I not let the matter rest there? Because as the hubbub had shown, some regarded my attitude towards Alger Hiss as relevant to my fitness to hold office, and those people were entitled to know it. One must be true to the things by which one lives. The counsels of discretion and cowardice are appealing. The safest course is to avoid situations which are disagreeable and dangerous. Such a course might get one by the issue of the moment, but it has bitter and evil consequences. In the long days and years which stretch beyond that moment of decision, one must live with oneself. And the consequences of living with a decision which one knows has sprung from timidity and cowardice go to the roots of one's life. It's not merely a question of peace of mind, although that's vital. It's a matter of integrity of character. Third, regarding the substance of my attitude, Mr. Hiss was in the greatest trouble in which a man could be. The outcome of his appeal could have little bearing on his personal tragedy. It was toward a man in this situation that I found applicable the principle of compassion stated in the gospel. It represented a tradition in which I had been bred going back beyond the limits of my memory. Fourth, I could not believe that what I said carried the slightest implication of condoning the offenses that Mr. Hiss had been charged with or of which he had been convicted. But for the benefit of those who would create doubt where none existed, I will accept the humiliation of stating what should be obvious, that I did not and do not condone in any way the offenses charged, whether committed by a friend or by a total stranger, and that I would never knowingly tolerate any disloyal person in the Department of State. Well, not all liberals let Atchison off the hook. One criticized Atchison for in indulging in a personal luxury that could only damage the State Department. And this critic and other liberals believe that treason is grounds for turning your back on a friend. Suspicion of the establishment in the wake of Hiss's convection occurred, under, uh, occurred among members of the establishment itself. Uh, John Foster Dulles, you remember, was one of Hiss's mentors at the Carnegie Endowment, became Secretary of State a few years later when Eisenhower became president. And he became a s very concerned about a certain nominee to an ambassadorial post and began asking him a lot of questions about his background and what he's done and what he's read and that sort of thing. Is there anything fishy in your, in your past? And the, the guy said to him, Foster, for God's sake, why are you asking me all these questions? And Dulles said, I couldn't stand another Alger Hiss. Now, a few liberals, who I call the Our Boy Alger crowd, um, Harvard graduates, people who read The New Yorker, could not bring themselves to believe that their boy could be guilty. Or if he was, he was certainly a much better fellow than that dreadful man, Chambers. Uh, one very dignified Park Avenue matron once said to me that she said Chambers was the real scoundrel for telling tales that are better left untold. Uh, and mostly from these people, several versions of the real lowdown on the case began circulating, uh, mostly trying to exculpate Hiss to some extent. And the most widespread of these was that the real culprit, and you still hear this from some old people on the East Coast, the real spy was Mrs. Hiss and that Hiss was taking the fall for her. He was such a perfect gentleman. He went to prison for her. Um, these people believe that she either did all the, the espionage by herself without his knowing about it, or that she had led him to do it. 
he being a, in the second version, he was a mere liberal, but he was weak and she followed her, he followed her in, in, in enticements. Um, this supposedly, by the way, was the belief that she was the main culprit of two of his major lawyers, William Marbury and Edward McLean, and also the belief of uh, supposedly the judge at the first trial and Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, this theory does not hold up to examination. Uh, the man who knew Mrs. Hiss better than any other person other than Alger was her first husband, and he is supposed to have said that to imagine Priscilla leading Alger is to imagine a rowboat pulling the Queen Mary. Uh, besides, Alger Hiss is over 18, and he's fully responsible for his acts. And as to the possibility that she did the spying and typing all by herself without his knowledge, um, that doesn't explain why Hiss in the first place would take home all this paper that doesn't have anything to do with his job, uh, but that the Soviet Union would want to know about, and also requires to you to believe that she could filch documents from his briefcase and be typing up a storm, you know, for an hour every night, and he never asks what's going on or sees that she's taking papers from his briefcase. Um, someone whom I once met and who knew Mrs. Hiss late in her life, um, had an interesting point of view. I asked him, what do you make of the people who blame it all on her? And he said, funny you should ask me that question. Uh, er, early on in our friendship, he said, she told me, don't ask me anything about my life with Alger. Uh, but one day, and, and he said she was a fascinating woman. She was the kind of woman who could talk to you about 50 different subjects at lunch. And he said, one day I asked her out of the blue, uh, not tell me what happened in the 30s, but the question you asked me, he said, I, I asked her, what do you make of the people who blame it all on you? And he said, Mrs. Hiss just smiled at me and said, people have been blaming me for everything that's gone wrong in Alger's life since the day we met. And that's all she'd say. And then this man um, added his little interpretation, said, you have to remember who it is that's saying these things about her. They're all Alger's friends from Harvard Law School and the State Department in Georgetown. They're all liberals of the 30s and 40s, but they're all male chauvinist pigs. And they didn't like her because she was an uppity woman. She was not, to content, she was not content to spend her life pouring tea for other State Department wives. Now, some liberals and intellectuals also attempted to justify his conduct, saying, okay, he did spy, but he was like Julian Wadley. He was a greater Wadley trying to fight fascism by sharing information with the Soviet Union when it was the major anti-Nazi government in the world. And this theory was scorned by the famous British feminist and socialist writer Rebecca West as showing, in her words, chaotic moral and intellectual values. And she said, in order to fight Hitler, it was not necessary to become either a communist or a traitor. She said, from her experience in Britain's anti-fascist movement, the communist role in the anti-fascist movement was sporadic only when it served the foreign policy of the Soviet Union and was for the, was for the sole purpose of hijacking the anti-fascist movement and making it a wholly owned subsidiary of the Communist Party. She said anybody who knew anything about the Communist Party would know it had no sincere opposition to totalitarianism. Then she said, third, this explanation, if it excuses anyone, doesn't fit his. Maybe if you began spying after the appeasement of Hitler began in 1938, you could say, I was just trying to help fight fascism. But if you're making this excuse for his, I think you're accepting as true the story Chambers was telling. And that has Hiss in the communist underground in the middle of 1934. And at that point, she noted, uh, Hitler had been in power for all of 15 months. And to attribute Hiss's communism in the middle of 1934 to anti-fascism means that in, he traveled the enormous distance from being a middle-of-the-road Democrat to being in the communist underground in only 15 months. And that's making, that's making Mr. Hiss a little quick on the trigger. And she said, finally, uh, the problem with the greater Wadley explanation is that Mr. Hiss has never uttered such nonsense. He says he, doesn't take, he says he didn't take the documents. One of the aftershocks of the guilty verdict, and the one that I find most interesting, is that it provoked something among many Democrats and liberals that you seldom see among political activists, and that's genuine soul-searching. A lot of Democrats and liberals said, you know, I hate to admit it, but... <clears throat> 
when we're in charge for 16 years, we have the White House, both houses of Congress, we appoint the bureaucrats, we're, a pro we're responsible for the national security. And at the end of that time, there are, with Harry Dexter White and Alger Hiss, there are two Soviet spies of sub-cabinet rank, and God knows how many at lower levels. We blow it. And that, that doesn't just look bad, that is bad. And for all the areas where we Democrats and liberals can give ourselves big pats on the backs and gold stars for what we've done in the last 16 years, this is an area where a lot of us have got to give ourselves Ds and Fs. And we need to apologize to the American people. We need to clean house and err on the side of cleanliness. Nobody has the right to a government job. We have to put systems in place to make sure this never happens again. And then after we've done that at the office, a lot of us have to go home and look in the mirror and say to ourselves that we were very naive about communism and the Communist Party and the Soviet Union. We fell for their poses. We're just liberals in a hurry. I remember a college professor of mine who'd been a lefty in the 30s warning us in the 60s, saying, we had a saying in the 30s, there are no enemies on the left. And he said, boy, did we get that one wrong. A very wise analysis of this case along these lines came from Leslie Fiedler, who was a liberal college professor and literary critic, he said, many of us liberals want to believe Hiss is innocent because we ourselves do not want to face our earlier naivete about communism and the party in the Soviet Union. If Hiss is innocent, maybe we're still innocent. If he can bury his sins, maybe we can bury ours. An especially shameful act for people who claim to be specially endowed with analytical skill and principles. Fiedler wrote, certainly a generation was on trial with Hiss. On trial not for having struggled towards a better world, but for having substituted sentimentality for intelligence in that struggle. What is involved is not any question of all or most New Dealers being like Hiss, secret agents of the KGB, but the question of their having been so busy denying there was a KGB or that it mattered that they could not identify an enemy of all the values in which they most profoundly believed. It is not necessarily that we liberals be self-flagellants. We have desired good, and we've done so, but we've also done great evil. And without that understanding of what the Hiss case tries desperately to declare, we will not be able to move forward from a liberalism of innocence to a liberalism of responsibility. And taking up on this challenge, in the next year, a number of liberals, perhaps most prominently Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. and Sidney Hook, fashioned a liberal view in this country that was just as anti-communist as the conservatives, uh, which maybe was all the more sincere because it was, generally, it was genuinely concerned with civil liberties and civil and labor rights and all the other rights of the common people, and in using government to make people's life better, which is what com which communism does not do. Schlesinger also argued, and I think he was right, that some people in the New Deal were soft on communism because of the New Deal's naivete not because of the New Deal's affinity for communism. Yes, we screwed up in this area, but it was a bug, not a feature. Only a very, very few people left of center could say, I told you so, along with the right-wing Republicans. And these were the old leftists who actually had experience with the Communist Party and the Soviet underground. Diana Trilling wrote that the Hiss case produced shock among everyone, and that while for most people it was the shock of surprise, uh, for old leftists like her, it was the shock of recognition. She said that everyone in or near the Communist Party in the 30s knew there was a hidden secret wing of the party. She wrote that many liberals looking at Hiss and, and Chambers, and please note she mentioned both of them, said to themselves, there but for the grace of God go I. Um, Professor John Kenneth Galbraith had a very interesting and unusually perceptive view of the case an explanation of why the guilty verdict was such a raw nerve for so many liberals for so long. What I'm about to say is what he wrote with a little added interpretation by me. He noted that in, when he first appeared before HUAC, Chambers had not accused of any hiss of any crimes and had gone out of his way to be sympathetic to all of his fellows from the 30s. Chambers described underground communist work as a sin but a forgivable one one for which you could atone, as he tried to atone, by working at Time magazine. And he left Hiss an opening. And Hiss, in his first statement to Hueck, could have admitted to being in the chat group, said, in my youth I did some foolish things. Who hasn't? Um, and more than a few people speculated uh, 
that if Hiss had done that, if he'd used his first time at the microphone to create understanding, not only would he have gotten away with it and the case would never have happened as a big case, but maybe the whole next few years would have been a lot less harsh. Maybe there never would have been a Senator McCarthy, and maybe this country would have uh, dealt with the problem of uh, treason in a less contentious manner. But, of course, Galbraith noted Hiss did not say that. He said, I've never been a communist, I've never spoken to a communist, I've never had a communist friend. How dare you insinuate that I, the great Alger of the Hopkins and Harvard, would ever consort with communists. And he implied that to have ever had anything to do with communism, to have ever known a communist, would have been this god-awful crime against nature. And that was a much simpler standard than the one Chambers was proposing, and those words took wing, and that became the standard. Hiss is the one who set the standard for the McCarthy era, and by the, the problem was, Galbraith said, that by that standard, a lot of us liberals had some explaining to do. Um, and when Alger not only denied but excoriated his own past, he was denying and excoriating ours. And Many of us recalled, uh, oh God, there was that fundraiser for the Scottsboro Boys Defense Fund we went to, and it turned out to be a communist front. How was I to know? Um, we didn't have as much explaining as Alger had to do, but on the other hand, we wouldn't have half a dozen of the best lawyers in the country giving us their time, and Eleanor Roosevelt writing sympathetic newspaper columns. And he said, this is the source of the anxiety that so many liberals felt about the Hiss case. Alger Hiss, by his absolute denial uh, and condemnation of any communist activity, gave a glass jaw to an entire generation of liberals, and he said millions of us walked through the next ten years hoping, in most cases successfully, that nobody would take a swing at it. Well, the final effect of the guilty verdict in the second trial was, of course, Richard Nixon became even more famous. The gamble he took with his career at the very beginning really paid off. Um, in 1950, he won a Senate seat and said goodbye to the penny ante world of the House in HUAC. And of course, in 52, Eisenhower chose him as his running mate. Um, Nixon's role in the case left a permanent bad impression among a lot of educated progressives in this country. The intense distaste those people felt for him really goes back to the Hiss case. Alger was one of them. He walked, talked, and act like, acted like one of them. Hiss fooled them, and Nixon was the guy who proved him to be a traitor and them fools, and nobody likes to be shown up as a fool. Nixon said in, in the 1990s, they never forgave me for what I did to Alger Hiss, although the person the progressives should never have forgiven, should never have forgiven was Hiss. Nixon reciprocated during his famous Checkers speech in the 52 campaign. He said, I remember the dark days of the Hiss case. Some of the same columnists, some of the same radio commentators who were attacking me now were violently opposing me at the time I was after Alger Hiss. But I continued to fight because I know I was right. And I can say to this great television and radio audience that I have no apologies to the American people for my part in putting Alger Hiss where he is today. When he ran for governor of California in 1962 and lost, and then hit his famous last press conference where he retired from politics and said, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore, he said to the assembled journalists, for 16 years, ever since the Hiss case, you've had a lot of fun. You've had an opportunity to attack me. Well, next we go back to court, and we delve into the theory that Hiss dined out on for the rest of his life that his conviction was the result of forgery by typewriter. 